Um, it is a very great honor and a big pleasure uh, for me to introduce Ernst Fair. Um, I will try to keep it short, um, as he's so well known that probably uh, most of you don't need an introduction. Ernst Fair grew up in Austria and in 1986 graduated with a PhD in economics from the University of Vienna. Um, he has been professor of microeconomics and experimental economics at the University of Zurich since 1994 and has stayed there despite receiving many offers of full professorships from other prestigious institutions, such as the University of Bonn, Princeton, Berkeley, NYU, and others. Uh, he's been named the most influential German-speaking economist uh, by the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. He is also one of the most cited economists worldwide. His work has also got a large number of second-order citations that show that his ideas inspired other work, which in turn has inspired further research. He has also published in journals such as Nature and Science, which shows that his work is highly relevant also to other disciplines. Ernst Herr's pioneering work on human behavior advanced the integration of psychological and sociological ideas into mainstream economics. He helped to formalize ideas about human behavior inspired by psychology and sociology um, and devised very smart experimental studies to show that his models made more accurate predictions than neoclassical theories. By this, he contributed to the so-called behavioral transformation in economics that made its understanding of human decision-making more similar to that of other social sciences. In recent years, this opening of economics towards concepts from other social sciences has in turn led those sciences to become more interested in the methods developed in economics and behavioral economics in particular, such as formal modeling of behavior and the use of experimental and empirical research designs to identify causal relationships. This has led to a very productive blurring of boundaries and a greater exchange of ideas across different fields. So what we are now seeing is something like the emergence of a universal social science. Ernst Fair is the leading researcher on the evolution of cooperation and pro-social behavior. He has done extensive research on the impact of social, on, of social preferences on competition, cooperation, and uh, on competition, cooperation, and on the psychological foundations of incentives. For example, his paper with Klaus Schmidt on a theory of fairness, competition, and cooperation, published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics in 1999, has been tremendously influential. The theory of inequity aversion developed in this paper has been able to explain behavior across a great number of strategic gains in which people systematically seemingly harm themselves to decrease the payoff of others if they perceive their share to be unfairly small. More recently, Ernst Fair has also worked on the role of bounded rationality in strategic interactions and on the neurobiological foundations of social and economic behavior. His ideas continue to strongly influence young researchers in his field and beyond. They do so not only via their broad dissemination of his papers, as mentioned in the beginning, but also through the many people he inspired personally. Of his PhD students, many have become successful researchers themselves and have influenced their own PhD students, some of which have become my co-authors and colleagues. That said, you're probably eager um, to, to hear Ernst Fair's lecture, so I'm handing over to him and I'm not keeping the digital floor any longer. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this nice introduction. So I try to share my screen now and to make, uh, so you should see my screen now, and in particular, yes, do you see the full slides? Yes. Here on? Okay, fine. So, well, again, thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Uh, the topic of my presentation is other regarding preferences and redistributive politics, and it's joint work with Thomas Epper and Julia Sen. Uh, this work is motivated by the fact that, in at least in advanced capitalist countries, we have seen a rise in inequality, 
and this rise in inequality uh, has been associated with a stronger demand for redistribution. And in that context, we ask therefore the question, what motivates people to support redistribution of income and wealth through political means? And there is actually a pretty large literature already in political economy on that, that discusses various reasons. I can't discuss all of them, but for example, theory and evidence suggests that when people believe that they can make it uh, in society, so that they can move upwards, that they can increase their income and their status, then they are generally less inclined to support redistribution. Where the bigger actual or perceived inequality in a society, the bigger the support for redistribution. There's also one other important determinant of the support for redistribution, which is related to the belief about the individual sources of wealth and poverty. For example, if people believe that the wealthy are wealthy because they just have been lucky, because they have inherited it largely, as opposed to they have put effort forward to, to become rich, then ha that has generally quite substantial implications for their individual support for redistribution. The same applies to poverty. So the extent to which people believe that the poor deserve that we help them because it's not their fault that they are poor, to that, to that extent they're much more willing to support redistribution. And there are many other arguments that have been put, put forward that I can't all discuss here. But what's interesting in this context is that other regarding preferences have been relatively rarely discussed in the political economy literature. And uh, there are papers who do that, that do that. For example, a paper by Pisman, Yakela, and Karik, and Kersh, Bamer, and Müller. Uh, and, but these are exceptions, basically. So there are basically, and, and it's kind of surprising because other regarding preferences, they directly capture individuals' preferences for distributional outcomes. So one might hypothesize that they should play a role in the demand for redistribution. And in fact, there is quite considerable laboratory evidence that indicates that there is such a thing like an altruistic concern for social welfare. By that I mean that there are people who are willing to give up resources in order to increase what I call the total pie that's available to all in the group, let's say, or that are willing to sacrifice resources to help the worse off. I mean, I've seen Jim Andreoni, for example, among the audience, and Jim has also contributed quite a bit to, these, to the study of these altruistic concerns in the laboratory. And then there is also a literature, the literature where I have played a part on inequality aversion that suggests that there are some people around that are inequality averse, and that might affect uh, the demand for redistribution. Now, what do we do in this paper? Well, we ask the following questions. So how do other regarding preferences generally influence the demand for redistribution? And the analysis we start with is theoretical in, in nature. Uh, and we do this by incorporating other regarding preferences into the classical Meltzer-Richard model uh, of, of redistribution. Uh, then we measure other regarding preferences in a broad sample of the Swiss population and we uh, characterize in particular the distribution of other regarding preferences in that sample. Uh, and for example, what's the share of people that are altruistic? What's the share of people that are inequality diverse or selfish in the sample? And then we study the relationship between other regarding preferences at the empirical level and support for redistribution. And we do so by controlling for all the determinants that you have seen on the first slide or the second slide I showed you. So our question is taking into account all the other determinants that have been mentioned in the literature uh, and controlling for these other sources of demand for redistribution. Is there a remaining significant role for other regarding preferences to explain the demand for redistribution? Uh, and, final, and, and, and in addition, is this role that we discover empirically, is this role consistent with the predictions of the theory? Fourth, we also 
are able to quantify the role of other regarding preferences relative to other factors. And fifth, we ask the question, are different types of other regarding preferences associated with differences in the nature of support for redistribution? Or in other words, is an altruistic individual showing supporting different kinds of proposal compared to an inequality adverse individual? And does this show up in the data? Okay, so we study these questions in the context of four uh, strongly redistributive national plebiscites that took place in Switzerland. Many of you may know that Switzerland has a quite extensive uh, direct democratic system, and we had four pretty radical redistributive proposals in the last 10 years. Uh, one was, for, was called Fair Tax Code uh, Referendum, and one, this proposal wanted to increase the taxes for the rich, one other proposal was the so-called 1 to 12 initiative, which would have kept the ratio between the lowest and the highest salary paid in each company to 1 to 12. I mean, this would have basically introduced uh, a radical form of egalitarian socialism through the back door, because currently we have, we have ratios that are more like, at least in the big companies, that are more like 1 to 100 or maybe 1 to 200. And in U.S. companies, it's maybe around to 400. Uh, then we had a pretty radical minimum wage proposal that would have paid every employee in Switzerland, every full-time employee, 4,000 Swiss francs per month uh, or uh, roughly 50,000 Swiss francs per year. Uh, uh, and then we had an unconditional basic income initiative four years ago that would have introduced a universal basic income that would have given every adult household member roughly, that was the idea, 2,500 Swiss francs unconditional. Okay, so uh, why do we do this in Switzerland? Well, we don't do this in Switzerland because we live in Switzerland, because there are distinct advantages of doing this in Switzerland. Uh, one advantage is that because we have direct democracy, redistributive proposals that actually are presented in the political domain, they can be separated from other political issues. Because when, a when, when people decide in a referendum, they decide on that proposal and nothing else, basically. So whereas, for example, when I decide in a representative democracy, I have to decide in favor of a party or a person and that person is a bundle of, represents a bundle of different things, okay? Then abortion issues play a role, uh, other political, other, other economic policies play a role, uh, cultural issues play a role, religion may play a role. That's all kind of separated here because there's just the policy proposal itself that people have to decide on, on okay? Now, second, uh, the, because of this direct democratic nature of the decision making, we have a limit on backdoor negotiations. In representative democracies, there's a lot of political exchange happening in the parliament. So I favor, I, I give you here my favor and you give me your favor in a different, uh, for a different law. So these backdoor no negotiations, uh, at, le at least in some political systems, tend to make redistribution very expensive. Because in order to get the support of some, some political parties or some parliamentary sections, you need to, pro you need to promise something to them. And that could, that, that's typically expensive. And because we have this backdoor, we have a limit on these backdoor negotiations, we have a, that we have a mitigation of the general distrust in politics, I believe. And actually, we have results that support that. Uh, you can remind me later on. And in that context, it's important to remind you, for example, there is a paper by these four authors, Kusien, Konort, Mzais, and Stancheva, and they show that lack of trust in politicians and in politics is a major obstacle to redistribution in the US. So people who are in principle in favor of redistribution, they are so distrustful of politics that when they have to decide on on, on, on redistribution issues, then they, 
typically are not in favor of that because they say that's just giving more money to the politicians and then they can use that money inappropriately. Now, there is also one other aspect here is because we have a lot of discussions in, before a referendum takes place. And because we have these discussions, uh, we thought that by reminding people in the survey that we conducted for our study, by reminding people on the previous referendum, we can kind of prime the arguments that have been put forward in favor or against the referendum. So you might think of these discussions as uh, generating a more enlightened public. Now, I'm not claiming that this is generally this, the, the case in, a, in, a, in, a, in our political systems, because it, can, it is also possible that the discussions, because of strong media bias, generate the opposite. But I don't think that this happens in Switzerland, where most people still watch national TV, where we don't have partisan media like Fox News or The Sun. And so we thought that asking Swiss citizens about a specific previous redistributive proposal will, is likely to evoke the memory of the discussed costs and benefits and increases the likelihood of informed choices in our survey. And finally, we can validate the subject's answers with actual behavior in the referendum, and I'll show you later on how we did this. So there are distinct advantages of the Swiss setup for studying this question. And, uh, and here is uh, now the theory that we are going to, to put forward. It's, basic, it's basically based on, on the incorporation of other regarding preferences into a Meltzer-Richard model of, of redistribution. And that model is very simple. And by the way, Dimmick et al., these are two political scientists that have done this before us. Very nice papers. They wrote very nice papers on that. And the idea here is very simple. We have a linear tax on income, okay? A linear tax tau on income of each individual yi, and the, the, the proceeds of, that, of the tax, the public proceeds of the tax, they are used to finance a lump sum transfer to everybody. There are quadratic redistribution costs, and so consumption of individual i in this a simple setup is just CI is given by the income that remains after the linear tax plus the lump sum transfer. And the innovation here relative to standard models is just that we introduce inequality aversion into the model. And don't be kind of, uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, the pro so the, you don't have to understand this formula completely. What you have to understand is that this is the, that this is the goal that individuals have when they are inequality averse. And what the key idea here is that if other individuals have higher consumption than I have, let's say I, my consumption is CI, then that enters negatively into my utility function. Okay. So I value that negatively if if I have an alpha, that is a positive uh, number. So we call this the behindness aversion motive, and you could call it also envy if you like. So this is kind of formalizing the idea that some people may be envious. And the second term is formalizing the idea that some people may show empathy towards those who are poorer than they are. For example, uh, if, if I, my consumption is higher then the consumption of individual J, let's say that's you, then I value that negatively because I don't like it to be better off than you. I mean, that's the opposite of a status motive. It's an empathy motive. So I care for those who are worse off than I am. So that's the general idea. And this is captured by these two coefficients, alpha and beta. If alpha is positive, the individual is behind this averse or envious. If beta is positive, the individual is empathic and is willing to help those who are worse off. We call that a happiness version or help, help those who are worse off than the individual itself. Okay, so instead of, I don't go through the math here, I show you in a graph what are the implications of this theory. So what you see here is the following. You see here basically the predictions of the theory. You have on the horizontal axis the gross, in, the gross income of an individual. 
And on the vertical axis, you have the preferred tax rate of a given individual, of an individual with a given income. And what you see here is that the selfish individuals, these are those who have neither behindness nor aheadness aversion, they, they are basically represented by this black negatively sloped line. So the richer these individuals become, the less they, the lower the tax rate they support. Okay, a very simple idea. So because if I'm richer, I have to pay more because the, the tax is a percentage of my income. And that means if I'm only self-interested, I'm more against free distribution. So there's just a, a, a negatively sloped neg relationship between own income and support for uh, redistribution, basically. Now, if you look at, at the green line, that's what inequality averse individuals do. They, because they are behind this averse, the poor or the poorer individuals, they dislike to be behind, they're more in favor of redistribution over a longer segment of incomes, and only then the decline, the, the support for redistribution declines. And uh, the, the blue curve uh, represents those individuals who show no behind this aversion but are empathic. They are just willing to help the birds off. Uh, but they're not behind this averse. They, they're not envious, basically. You could call them kind of, they're altruistic towards those who are worse off than they are. Okay? Uh, that's the prediction, basically. So, other regarding preferences shift up the support for redistribution, and they do so more for those who are inequality averse than for those who are just, let's say, altruistic or ahead or empathic. So that's the, the prediction of the, of the theory. And now uh, we come to the empirical part, basically. Uh, so how do we measure other regarding preferences? Well, we do this in an online survey with roughly 800 Swiss individuals. And the, the way we do this is as follows. So in the online survey, people make decisions and they can earn real money through these decisions. And what you see here on the horizontal axis is the money they themselves get from a particular decision. And on the vertical axis, they see the money that some other anonymous individual that participates in the larger study gets. And so an individual can choose one of these seven points on this line. And if it chooses this point here on the bottom, then that means that's the most selfish choice because that gives the individual the most own income. If he chooses that this other point at the top here, then the individual is giving up a lot of income in, to favor the other, the other individual. Okay? So I measure basically the willingness to give up money for the sake of helping another individual. And the way we represent this in the, in the online survey is, is, is shown in this graph. So basically, the individuals choose one of these seven bars and so, for example, if they go for equality, then we go for this bar, 750, 750 for both. But they could also be totally so to selfish or self make a selfish decision, then they, they go for 900 for themselves and 600 for the other person. And actually, this is, these are decisions for real money, okay? These are not just hypothetical. This is not just hypothetical money. Okay, so now we also have uh, decision situations where the line uh, on, on which the different allocations that can be chosen uh, has a positive slope. What does that mean? Well, it means uh, that going up the line makes both individuals better off, but one individual gains more than the other. For example, here, the other individual has more income, it's above the 45 degree line, than, than I have, okay? So this is inequality, and the question we can ask by giving people this decision situation is, are people willing to sacrifice own money, so to go to the left here, to reduce the money of others, okay? And when they, do, when they are willing, they might go, for example, to the middle point, this, is, this means equality, so they would be willing in this case to give up own money to go to the left here in order to decrease the income of the others. And that's what we call inequality aversion. Okay? 
So this would mean a positive alpha in, in terms of the field. And so we have a lot of budget lines here, and I can't go into this. So we, we put a lot of effort into how we measure that. We can measure. So this, is, um, this has a theoretical rationale, what we do here. Um, but uh, uh, what we want is, based on the choices people make, we can characterize what they are, uh, basically, uh, what preference type they are, what type of other regarding preference they have. Okay, so then just one slide on how we mesh characterize, what is the method that helps us to characterize the distribution of preferences in the sample. Uh, we apply here a method that has rarely, if at all, been used in economics, and it's completely data-driven. It's not relying on any assumptions about utility functions, about the number of existing types. It doesn't impose any assumptions on, on the structure of errors people make when they make decisions. And we also validate the, the method to out-of-sample predictions. That's all I'm telling you here. Uh, I'm just showing you the results, basically, okay? But that itself is kind of, I think, a nice, nice addition to the literature that we use this non-parametric Bayesian clustering algorithm. Okay, so now I show you the results. I show you basically how does the distribution of preferences look like in this broad sample of the Swiss population. And in order to do so, let me, let me go back to, to this budget line here to this line, okay? We use now the following notation. We say if the individual makes a selfish decision, this is the decision down here, okay? We denote this by Z equals one. If the individual is going for equality, we denote this with a variable Z equal to 0.5. And if the individual is totally minimizing the own payoff along this budget line, then we call this Z equals zero, okay? Just that you know what you see on the next graph. And here, again, if the individual is maximizing the own payoff, that's the upper, when the budget, when this line slopes upward, then we call it Z equals one because that's the maximal payoff the individual can get here, Z equals one. If it goes in the middle, it's Z equals 0.5. If it goes, if it minimizes own income, it's set equals zero. Okay, just that you understand what you see now. Okay, so that's what I have written down here. Set equals one means maximize own payoff. Set equals 0.5 means you go, individual goes for equality. And set equals zero means it minimizes own payoff. And here we see one type of individual that the method that we apply gives us. And we see this for what we call negatively sloped budget lines and for positively sloped budget lines. And what you see just by looking at these two graphs is most of them go in the middle. So basically they go always for equality. Okay, this, that's the reason why we call this type inequality averse. Okay, and interestingly, we have 50% of the population who is like that. So 50% is inequality averse. And we can directly infer the preference parameter, although we use a non-parametric method to determine them, you can see with your, just with your eyes that they have to be in the quality base. Now then we have another type of individual. And this individual behaves very similar for negatively slow budget lines, they go into the middle. But for positively slow budget lines, you know, these are the ones that cross the 45 degree line from below. These individuals always go to Z equals one. So they maximize their own payoff. And by doing so, they maximize the other person's payoff. So they are never willing to sacrifice money to reduce other people's payoff for the sake of equality. And we call them altruistic people with an altruistic social welfare concern. They are not behindness averse, but they are empathic, so to speak, to those who are uh, worse off than they themselves are. So we have now two big groups, and what remains is a selfish type that goes always to set equals one, and they go always for maximum, so basically they, they go for the, 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 
the selfish choice, basically, regardless of the slope of the budget line. And we call them the selfish type. And notice, this is quite interesting. The pure, the, these, these people who are predominantly selfish, they are a minority. And this is not the first time that I get results like this. Now, selfishness is the standard assumption that has been the standard assumption in economics. But if you, that's a general lesson. If you allow the costs of non-selfish behavior to vary, when the costs become relatively low, then most people do no longer behave totally selfish. So the degree to which people are selfish depends on the cost of selfish behavior. To the degree to the degree to which people behave selfishly depends on the cost of, so to speak, altruistic behaviors, non-selfish behaviors. And if these costs of non-selfish behaviors are low, then most people no longer behave fully in a fully selfish manner. So the fully selfish type is typically a minority, uh, in, at least in the data that I have collected. Now, uh, I want to say something on student samples here. Because most, social, the, the, the most work on social preferences in experimental economics is on student samples. And in student samples, you basically see very little inequality aversion. We repeated the same experiment that I have shown you with this broad population sample with university students from the U University of Zurich and we find less than 10% inequality aversion. So inequality aversion seems to be largely absent among students, but quite prevalent in the population. I have also another data set from Denmark, where I see similar results for the adult population. There we have roughly 4,000 people in the sample, and more than one third of the Danish population that we have in that sample shows inequality version, again, much more than what we see in student samples. So I have been teaching that students don't behave very differently to non-students for 20 years. And now it's in my own domain of work where I had to revise my opinion on that. Okay, so now uh, another question is, is there important heterogeneity beyond the three types? Well, there is, but I can't go into that because with the, with the three types, they represent the most parsimonious uh, characterization of preference heterogeneity in our sample. But if you have a question that I can go into that. Okay, so now how do we measure support for redistribution? So we have now one empirically important empirical ingredient. We have a measure of other regarding preference. We know which type people are belonging to. And the, the support for redistribution we measure, for example, as follows for the minimum wage initiative. This is what subjects read in the online survey. In May 2014, Switzerland voted on the introduction of a minimum wage of 22 Swiss hours per hour. That's approximately 4,000 Swiss francs per month. This referendum wanted to make sure that companies pay each of their employees at least 22 Swiss francs per hour work. Suppose that next weekend another referendum takes place in which the minimum wage is set equal to 16.5 per hour, which is approximately 3,000 Swiss francs per month. And then the question comes, would you support the introduction of a minimum wage of 16.5 Swiss francs per hour, or would you reject this referendum? And we allow five answer categories. You support or rather support. That's coded as a plus one. You say don't know, it's zero, and you can rather reject or reject it, which is coded as a minus one. You use different coding schemes, it doesn't matter for the results. Okay, so we can we can do it up and we can do that in many different ways, but it doesn't really matter. And then we construct an aggregate support index for support for political redistribution that just summarizes the ones or the zeros or the minus ones over the four referenda and divides it by four. Okay, it's just the average. We just take the average. Okay, so, uh, so, the, so basically our political support measure is a measure that goes from minus one to plus one because it's an average over four. And if you have a plus one, then you have voted in favor of redistribution in all four. If you have a minus one, you have voted against redistribution in all four. 
Okay, so now let me validate. To what extent can we believe what people say in this online survey is really what they would do? Okay, to what extent are they willing to back what they say in the survey to back up with a real willingness to pay, so to speak, to give up resources in favor of getting redistribution of income? Now, what we do here is we look in the Switzerland, we have different regions, different cantons. And now I know what the political support was in the different cantons when the referendum took place. And I know what the political support is in my online survey. And I have two referenda that were, com that were completely identical in the actual world where compared to our online survey. Okay? So, and for those referenda, I can correlate what people actually did on average in, in these cantons with what people say they would do when next weekend the same referendum would take place. And when I look at this correlation, I see a nice correlation across these cantons suggesting that our, what people say on average in our online survey is highly correlated with what actually occurred in the actual referendum, okay? We had an additional validation check. Two years later, we gave people the opportunity to spend money on NGOs, on civic groups that support redistribution or oppose redistribution. And we see whether their willingness to pay to support redistribution is correlated with their, what they say uh, in the online survey, and we find a, a strong correlation here. So basically, they are willing to put the money where their mouth is, supporting the, valid the validity of the political support measure that we collected in the online survey. Okay, so now two other, now we have everything we need. We, we know people's other regarding preferences. We know people's, uh, uh, we know what people voted or will vote, would vote, so to speak, and we can link that. And I show you first the raw data, and then I show you the, show you what happens if we control for everything. Okay. Now here is our first main result. What you see here is on the horizontal axis the income bracket that people reported being in. And here you see on the vertical axis the aggregate support for redistribution. And what you see here is for selfish people, for those who are classified having selfish preference, you see exactly what the theory predicts. They, they, their, their support for redistribution linearly declines as a function of their own income. Okay? This is the graph, the black line is the graph for the inequality averse individuals. And what you see is inequality averse individuals are much more willing to support redistribution when they are at higher incomes, which is also consistent with what the theory predicts. Because recall the graph that I showed you at the beginning. When people are relatively poor, then the selfish people and those with other regarding preferences, they have both a reason to be for redistribution because the selfish benefit from redistribution. So they vote for redistribution. That means the differences between those who are selfish and those who are other regarding should be small uh, when for people who have low income, but it should be large for people who have higher incomes. And that's exactly what we see. So the, the, in, the difference between the black and the gray line is largest for those who earn more than 10,000 Swiss francs per month. And finally, those with the social welfare concern, these are those who are, who are not behind this averse. They are slightly less supportive of redistribution, but still quite supportive. So basically we find qualitatively what we would expect from the theory uh, to be what, what's hypothesized by the, by the theory. Now, uh, let me say a little bit about the, the quantitative role of other regarding prayer because that's also important. So what is the difference between selfish and other regarding individuals in standard deviations of political support? And now look at maybe those who earn more than 10,000 Swiss francs. 
Then inequality aversion, those who are inequality averse, they are almost 60% of a standard deviation, more supportive of for it is more supportive for free distribution. That's a really big effect. Uh, and those who are in the income, have an monthly income of between 4,000 and 6,000 state strengths, they are still 30% of the standard deviation more supportive. And the, among the poor, uh, they, it's even the other way around, although the difference here is not significant. This is not a significant number, whereas these numbers here are significant. Now, when you look at those who have an altruistic social welfare concern, the numbers are typically lower than for those who are inequality averse. We have seen that in the previous graph, but they are still substantial. For example, those who are more than 10,000 Swiss francs per month, they are still roughly 50% of a standard deviation more supportive of redistribution. Okay, now, everything I have shown you here is just raw data. But you know, if, if you can't see it in the raw data and you need a lot of statistics, the results are not as powerful as you, when you can see it with your, with, just with your eyes. Here you see it just with your eyes. But of course we need to know, do these results hold up when we control for all the other determinants of support for redistribution that have been discussed in the literature, and they do. So the effects remain large after controlling for, for all the factors below. For example, we control for age, age squared, language, whether people are married, their education level. We control for cantonal fixed effects. That's important. So basically, because they are conservative cantons, where everybody is more conservative a little bit, and there are uh, progressive cantons. So we, when we control for that, nothing changes basically in terms of the effect of other regarding preferences. We control for risk aversion, we control for how patients they are, we control for negative and positive reciprocity. So negative and positive reciprocity has no role to play, basically. Risk aversion is also not significant, neither is patients. Actually, the main other variable that is important is this one here. Individual effort versus luck as determinant of individual success. Okay? And also mistrust in politicians plays a role. Now, mistrust in politicians plays quite an interesting role. The more people are mistrusting, the more people have mistrust in politicians, the more people believe that politicians are corrupt, the more they favor redistribution in these direct democratic referenda. And that makes a lot of sense because by voting for the referendum for the redistribution, they tie the politicians' hands because the polit politicians, they have to implement what's decided in the referendum. There's nothing else that can happen. Whereas in a representative democracy, there's a lot of haggling, a lot of negotiate backdoor negotiations potentially that, that happens. And for US data, it's just the opposite. For example, the more US people mistrust politicians, the more they are against redistribution. In Switzerland, it's the other way around. Now I show you here the impact of beliefs about the role of effort for individual success. And you see it in this graph. You see here again on the vertical axis, aggregate support for redistribution. On the horizontal axis, you see the income brackets. And this graph here, the, the upper graph shows you this, those individuals who believe that success is largely not under an individual's control. So success is largely due to luck or inheritance. And people who believe that, they show more aggregate support for redistribution. In, in contrast, people who believe that effort plays a large role, so that success is largely under an individual's control, they are significantly less supportive of redistribution. And here you see the size of this uh, coefficient, and you, you see that the, the size, the numbers are here substantially smaller than for other regarding preferences, uh, but still, still uh, substantial, so to speak. So that just tells you, well, other regarding preferences seem to be have, play a really large quantitative role uh, compared to, to other important arguments that have been put forward in the literature. Okay, so here I show you the role of future income mobility or whether people have been unemployed in the past. And you see that those who have 
uh, or those who believe the, those who believe they have a be, those who have a below median income expectations in the future, they are more supportive for redistribution. But it's quite quite noisy that, and it's actually never significant. And those who have a history of unemployment, these are this is the gray line here. They're slightly more generally slightly more willing to support redistribution, but again. The variable doesn't become significant, but it's the direction is okay of the effect. Now, let me come to the final part of the presentation, where I ask the question, can we better understand the properties of individual support for redistribution by taking into account uh, that people have different types of other regarding or social preferences? And uh, this is relevant to the following two initiatives because in the for the one to twelve initiative, this initiative was explicitly launched to constrain top incomes that are perceived to be outrageously high. You could view this initiative as, as the anti CEO initiative. You know, people people have been quite critical of the high CEO incomes, and so this initiative had a clear egalitarian focus, and it might have particular appeal, therefore. For inequality versus individuals, because it just restrains the income differences without any other purpose. Okay, so social welfare types, on the other hand, they have less reason to support income or reductions for the rich merely for the sake of higher equality. And similar for the fair taxes initiative, for which higher taxation of the very rich was the main motivation. It had a clear egalitarian focus, and again, individuals who don't care about inequality that have, should have, per se, less reason to support this in, in, initiative. And when you look at the data, you see this supported. So again, the aggregate support of the selfish declines. This is now, these are the, this is the aggregate data for the two, we call that tax the rich or reduce the income of the rich initiative. So what we do is we, we aggregate up the, the, the behavior of, uh, uh, over these two initiatives and show it here. And what you see here, aggregate support for redistribution is higher for inequality versus individual than for those with a social welfare concern. And again, the selfish support declines strongly with income. And that brings me already to an end. I don't show you the, the estimates because they just confirm what I said. So here are the conclusions. So we take advantage of Swiss direct democracy to study the role of social preference for actual redistributive proposals, we identify three fundamentally distinct types of other regarding preferences. And uh, we, we show that other regarding preferences are a key yet income dependent predictor of voting behavior in theory and a quantitatively important predictor empirically. And they play a particularly relevant role for the more affluent people as predicted by the theory and confirmed by the data. And uh, finally, the fundamental characteristics of other regarding preferences, namely whether people have an altruistic concern or whether they are inequality versed, they have implications for the type of redistributive proposal that people support. And that's also at least qualitatively supported by the data, although I must say that in the data, when we look at whether, whether, there, whether there's a significant difference oh. between the two types, it's not always significant. So we don't have enough data, but qualitatively we see that. And the overall message is taking into account other regarding preferences, provides a deeper understanding of political support for redistribution. And let me conclude with the following statement. So sometimes you hear that uh, those who are in favor of redistribution, they are just envious. But what the data actually show is that those who are in favor of redistribution, namely the, the other regarding, them, let's say the inequality diverse types, they are not just envious, they are also empathic. So they are willing to sacrifice money to help the poor, but they are also willing to sacrifice money to reduce equality, to reduce the income of the rich for the sake of equality. Thanks a lot for your uh, attention. Thank you very much. Uh, um, well, that was a, was a fantastic, fascinating talk. And I think another example of um, 
you know, you, I think your work from early on showed the relevance for what we do in the lab for the real world. It was labor markets early on, and now you branch out into the political domain. And so this was really um, fascinating and interesting, interesting to see how useful uh, these very simple measures um, that we've been developing collectively, I guess, uh, uh, over three decades. Uh, turn out to be in these um, very applied um, now political in this very applied political domain. So I'm I'm going through uh, the questions now. Um, let me start with uh, that was the first question asked. It's a very short and simple uh, technical question about um, um, when you made the comparison between uh, general population and student samples whether the student sample uh, that you were comparing to was mostly composed by economics and business students. That's a question by Leonard Schulz. Uh, I, this is a very quick answer. We, we in, in, for this type of experiment, we always rule out economists because we have the, there is always the, the lingering conjecture that they might be different uh, compared to others. And so these are not economists, no. These are non-economists who, okay. who don't show inequality and they show, don't show inequality they show a lot of they, they're, they're either selfish let's say 50-60% are selfish and 40-50% have this altruistic concern uh, and maybe there are 5-8% to 8 percent, uh, inequality verse. Okay. thank you um, so now we get into more elaborate questions. So uh, here's from, from Agnol Lorente. Um, he writes, uh, how does the prediction of the model change if citizens are heterogeneous in their aversity to inequality? In particular, how does it change if the risk aversion parameters are correlated with income? I, I take that, I mean, you were solving, I mean, you were solving opt individual optimization problem, right? It is not a general equilibrium kind of approach yeah. where I take into account what other citizens do. And my interpretation of the question is that, you know, what happens if you put this into a larger political economy context where I know that other people are also different and they do what they do? Well, uh, uh, I, first of all, I think strategic voting uh, for these referenda is very unlikely. Because the interesting thing is that they, that these referenda, I mean, they, they, they failed by a large margin, typically. I mean, the, the most successful one got 41% of the votes. And people, to some extent, knew that. And so I think uh, strategic voting is, is more relevant when, when you have tight, uh, a, a tight decision. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I, I want to point out that uh, the distribution of social preferences is the same for the rich and the poor. So there are equally many rich other regarding individuals as there are poor other regarding individuals. And the correlation with risk aversion is relative. We don't see a, 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 a big, and we don't see a correlation. Okay, this is, I'm sorry to interrupt because that fits perfectly, I think, the next question. I just so to put this into context, then, then, then let, let me read it. So this is a question by Nicolas um, The data delivers the joint distribution of individual preferences and redistributive attitudes conditional on income. This is interpreted as the effect of preferences on redistributive attitude. Can you discard that there is selection based on income into types? That is, those who remain selfish while they earn a lot are just less in favor of redistribution. So that's, that's exactly not what we find. So basically, what you're trying, right? so, uh, that's exactly, it's, it's, it's a very important argument so that, that he, he or she puts forward. But we find the same distribution of preferences in the different income categories. So, and, uh, so basically, when we control in the regression, uh, when we do the regressions, I mean, I can maybe I should I go I go back and show it show you the regressions. These are the regressions for for the one to twenty initiative and the fair taxes initiative. 
you recall the 1 to 20, we changed it slightly. We asked not for 1 to 12, but for 1 to 20. And what you see here is we control it for, we control, I mean, here, uh, when we do our regressions, we control for income, basically. You know, what we do here is basically, you, we do it here, we did a median split. Okay, and what you see here is basically that for those who have, for the 1 to 20 initiative, let's say, those who have a low income, uh, they, uh, they, they have very little, you see, you see very little, whereas the coefficient for those who have a high income is twice as large. And this is for social welfare concerns. Now for inequality aversion, it's much more, it's much more visible, basically. What you see here is the red, the red st stuff here. Those who have low income, you don't see a significant effect. I hope you can see this. And those who have high income, we get a large significant effect. And the same for the Fair Taxes Initiative, low income, no effect, high income, higher income, large effect. So here we keep, in, here we control for income by just doing the median split. But I can run regressions. If you look at the paper, which is available on the web, uh, we run regressions where we control for income, basically. Okay. And... Uh, uh, now, can I, can I have a follow-up question um, that, uh, from myself <laughs> on this? I mean, when I was looking at your income categories, um, you know, your poor, um, they, they, they don't appear that poor. Uh, yeah. you know, 3,900 Swiss francs in a month, um, you're categorized as poor. Um, well, this is poorer. It's not the poor. So basically, look, if you look at this graph, you see what I mean. So here... The selfish, so um, for those of between 4,000 and 6,000, the selfish and the social welfare concern individuals show the same support for redistribution. The inequality will show a bigger support for redistribution, but this difference is just not significant. Okay. But when you go here, let's say, this difference between the dark and the light gray dot, th that's becoming significant, you know. Or or here at the highest income category, because it's sufficiently, given the number of observations you have, it's sufficiently different to become significant. So here, here's a question um, uh, from, from Christian Rau um, about um, what you're measuring uh, in the experimental module where people have to make these allocation decisions. <laughs> So, uh, trying to understand, Christian writes, uh, trying to understand what other regarding preferences really capture. If I get it correctly, when deciding about the payoff distribution, respondents know nothing about the possibly benefiting individual. Um, but redistributing in real life has a clear direction from rich to poor. Um, so, how do you square that, right? I mean, in in, in your measure is sort of uh, about a redistribution decision to just a individual that is randomly drawn from the entire distribution. Why? Yeah. Um, Basically, this is perfectly, it's a very good question. Uh, the question is whether our other, other regarding preferences in the experiment contain information that's relevant or how people behave outside the laboratory. And by showing that link, I think we, we do show, yes, there is there's relevant information. We, we capture relevant information. So there is, if we would uh, run an experiment uh, where one individual is much richer than the other, we might get less variation, I think. Uh, than when what we get with an anonymous individual. So what you're so saying, is that you're saying the art, in some sense the artificial situation where I make this distribution decision between uh, myself and somebody I don't know anything about um, uh, turns out to be an advantage because it gives you more variation in the responses, um, and uh, so it's more useful than when you turn to the analysis of behavior in real life. Well, it's at least uh, capturing something important. That's that's my that's my point. So it's a very simple simple way of measuring other regarding preferences. 
And it probably, I mean, because people know nothing about the recipient, it's kind of, and because uh, there's another aspect here, the money is not earned. You know, it's money that, mon money that comes from the experiment. And that is not something that people, when they vote about redistribution, then they typically vote about giving up money that they have earned. On the other hand, what we have to take into account in, 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 when it comes to political decisions, these are typically for the individual low stakes decisions because each individual has a little impact on the, on the general outcome. So, so these are, and this is why other regarding preferences may play a bigger role in politics than in the economic domain because the decisions are typically lower stake. You know, I mean, if I vote for something, that doesn't change the outcome of the aggregate vote. And so I vote, vote more out of moral reasons. Uh, so morality kicks in much more strongly in the political domain than it may kick in in the economic domain. Um, so now uh, let me have a look here. Um, um, there's another question from Anyol coming in. Um, he says, he says, very nice paper. <laughs> One element in redistribution models is that taxes disincentivize effort. Is there something in the data that indicates that different types have different beliefs on the disincentivizing effects of taxes? If so, do different types have different beliefs? So we tried to measure uh, some, some of these correlations, but we didn't find much, so to speak. I mean, in, indirectly, the, 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 the interesting thing is that the, our data suggests that income is the most important kind of economic determinant of voting for redistribution or against it. We, but when we look at At, at arguments, other regarding preferences are clearly related to normative issues. I mean, they, are, they have, they, they, they give a normative, people have a normative reason when they are in the, the normativity going into their preferences. Now, when you look at the next important argument as in the, in the regressions, it's the, it's the belief whether luck or effort determines what you be whether you are individually successful. So whether you, this is, this is another strong determinant. And you can also interpret that as a fairness argument, as a fairness motive. Why? Because some people believe it's fair not to redistribute because most of the, uh, the, the, the going, the market distribution of income is, is determined by people's efforts. And therefore, in their view, it's fair to let it as it is and not to intervene politically. It's not a, a view that you may share, but it's still a, a fairness argument. Uh, whereas the purely economic arguments, we have some, we had some questions in the data, in the, in the, in the online survey, like, uh, do you benefit personally from the, from this, from the outcome of this referendum and in which way? Uh, we don't find when you control for income that variable doesn't become very significant, have much impact. Or whether it increases unemployment, it also didn't have much impact. Uh, it's more, it's really more these moral leverage than income, your own income per se, that seems to play a big role. Um, thank, thank you, Ernst. Let, let me um, ask a question of my own that uh, was, um, you know, occupying me um, already when you made some remarks about uh, your setup and then later when you turned to your results. I mean, you were advocating that uh, Switzerland um, is a particularly good um, um, place for you to do that. And of course, it's a natural, it's, natural laboratory. It's a natural laboratory. You, you have these wonderful data. Um, But, you know, it reminded me of uh, my friend uh, Peter Jonas, who passed away earlier this year and who was uh, serving on the curatorium of the BZB. 
And um, he uh, lived the last years of his life in Zurich. He was one of the few foreigners who was actually able to buy property in Zurich. Um, and, you know, when I talked to him about uh, Zurich, um, he always said um, the one thing that said, in order to understand uh, Zurich, uh, you have to see that it's uh, like socialism with money. And so, you know, it's a nice catchphrase. But um, it appeared to get into, you know, the heart of something that is sort of very specific, you know, at least very specific Zurich. Um, and I was wondering to... But this is Switzerland. This is not just Zurich. Yeah, sure. So this is what I wanted to, you know, is that, is, is, is that a specific Zurich thing? Are you worried about, um, you know, that the Swiss are somehow different? Um, what do you think would carry over uh, to other... Settings. I mean, uh, it is true that I mean I was truly surprised by the large share of inequality of our students here, because in our student samples we see we saw so much less, and so I, I my expectation was my most optimistic expectations would have been maybe twenty percent, but now it's fifty percent, and. In Denmark, we have roughly 34% of inequality diversity. So the, the, they're the population in our sample. These are, this is a sample of 30 to 50 year old people, uh, but many thousand people, you know, we have, uh, we have a one third, one third, one third categorization there. So yeah, compared to Denmark, the Swiss seem to, seem to be more inequality seeking. And, but I, so I, I plan, what I plan to do is actually an international study where we apply the methodology to many countries. And because it's easy to apply and, and related to you know, interesting outcome variables in these countries. Among them clearly also approval of redistribution, redistributive voting and so on. Uh, but I can't say more. So we don't have international data on inequality version. That's the reason why I want to study that at the international level. So here's one. Uh, so for now, um, the final question. So for just it's telling to the, the audience. So if you have other questions, post them now, because that might be the final question otherwise. Uh, by Ubina Okereke, if I pronounce that correctly. And let me, uh, instead of reading it, let me rephrase it. Um, so, uh, Obina uh, asks to what extent um, we should trust um, these uh, votes or these preferences in, in a, expressed in a referendum, given um, what we have learned from Brexit, where people were um, obviously voting against their own um, interests. Uh, in the end? Well, this is why we do uh, put a lot of effort into validating into validating our online measure. I mean, this is why we let me search for it. This is why we, we try to validate our online measure uh, and uh, with, with actual data and with uh, what people uh, whether people are willing to to uh, to uh, pay pay money to support NGOs that uh, that are uh, supporting redistribution. So this is this is this is why we went into all that validation stuff, you know. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the the result don't give us much reason to believe that it would be different, you know. Actually, I tried to find that correlation. I mean, we have so I have so many slides that are hidden that I I, I have difficulty finding <laughs> what I'm searching for. Uh, anyway, but I, I am pretty confident that what we find is, 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 uh, is yeah, here. I mean, this is why we, why we did all this here. Yeah. No? Okay, so now I think um, uh, the final, final question, um, uh, this comes uh, from uh, Christian Rau again. Um, who wants to know whether you also looked at interaction effects of yeah. regarding preferences, uh, you know, with other uh, 
uh, important drivers uh, for redistributive support? Well, we did look at interaction effects and we find relatively little except the interaction with income. And actually that's almost predicted. If you look at this graph here, then you see basically there must be an interaction here because uh, social preferences, they don't have a constant effect relative. Those who have social preferences, let's say the inequality verse, that the difference between those who are inequality versus and those who are selfish grows along the income axis. And that's just another way of saying there is an interaction between income and social preferences on redistributive voting. But when we, and that's what we find for inequality aversion. Although the, yeah, so that's what we find. But for other variables, we don't find much uh, interactions. We're through with, with, with social preference. Yeah, um, it, uh, it seems. Um, so I think it's up to me now to uh, say uh, thank you again for this um, excellent uh, and fascinating talk. And I can only hope um, that um, we can have you over to Berlin um, sometime soon for dinner. Uh, to have a Thanks a lot for having me. Uh, also only virtually <laughs> and thanks for listening it was a very content. important uh, answer i think it was a very who knows how long this is going on um, and uh, now of course we also see maybe once um, uh, the pandemic is over um, we might see some advantages of this type of format uh, so i think it was a very important moment uh, for the institute Uh, to try out this, um, you know, central form, format that is really central for us uh, in in this new uh, Zoom setting. And um, it was a real treat uh, to do that with you.